you will hear part of a consultation between a psychologist and a patient called Mr. Barry. Now look at the notes for extract one. Hi there, Mr. Barry. Your GP has referred you to me to discuss your anxiety. So tell me, how have you been feeling? Well, I'm still suffering from the anxiety and panic attacks and the medication that I'm taking. I found that it seems to have some side effects and it makes me still feel a little on edge. So I found it better to take the medication at night rather than in the morning and so I can get on with the day kind of thing. But I still feel quite anxious. Okay. Getting used to the medications can be difficult. Going back, when did you start the treatment again? Oh, uh, what, three weeks ago now? And that was the citalopram, the one to hopefully control the panic symptoms longer term, and the chlordiazepoxide, which is for the more short-term control. How many of the chlordiazepoxide are you using a day at the moment? Well, the doctor gave me 20 milligrams three times a day, but to be honest, I'm trying to cut them out. I only use them if I really, really need them. Good. And do you feel okay with that? Yeah, it's like I don't feel like they suppress me enough, if you get what I mean. I know that my main aim to tackle this is, to be honest, is getting fit and more exercise because I know that's the feeling that I need to aim towards because I know from past experience that when I work out, I feel better, I feel more relaxed, etc. So I'm trying to work towards that. So how many actually are you having at the moment? Uh, today, I've had to go into work just for a conference with my manager, you know, just to discuss how things are going and stuff. So I had to take two because I just felt like I couldn't manage it otherwise. Right. Okay. So over the past four or five days? Uh, none except for the two today. So you've actually been laying off them altogether? Yeah, I've been trying. And when I do take them, I don't, I only feel suppressed for a very short amount of time. Right. Now the citalopram medication... Yes, I'm on 20 milligrams once a day, and the side effects headaches were quite bad to begin with, and I'm still getting them, but I think that could be more stress-related, because they're not very, I wouldn't call them painful headaches, I just can feel they're there. I also had a sore ear, so I wondered if I might just have an infection or something too. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, but you're now taking this at Halopram at night. Yeah, I found that if I take it first thing when I get up, I still feel quite edgy, and also the side effects. Yes, okay, right. Now, the reason you started the treatment was because you were getting full-blown panic attacks. Can you tell me a bit more about the attacks? Yeah, well, I couldn't leave the house. My heart races, and I really struggle to breathe, and I just feel an intense fear. It makes me feel sick and dizzy if I go out into the street. You find it very difficult to get out and about. Are you beginning to normalize, do you think? Yes, I've managed. I've got, I went over to the soup store on my own and I managed. I felt a bit, a bit jittery at first, but you know, I've learned over the years after suffering quite severely with them years ago that you just have to take your mind to a different place. And you know, I just concentrated on what I wanted from the shop. That was the first time I've been out on my own since I started on the medication. you will hear part of a consultation between a GP and a patient called Mr. Martin. Hello, Mr. Martin. I'm Dr. Hampton. Hello, nice to meet you. And you. Uh, how can I help you? Uh, well, I've come about my stomach. I've had problems with it over the years, on and off, but at the moment it seems to be worse again. Uh, mainly kind of just real sore feelings across here. Mm, okay. Um, when you get the pain, where is it exactly? Can you show me? 
Yes, it's, it's here. It's sort of across the upper part of the tummy and down here to the middle of the tummy. Uh-huh. And how would you describe the pain? Could you put words to it? It's more sore. I can't say it's a real pain. It's more a sore feeling and like irritation, maybe? Right. Um, does it move around or, or is it always in the same place? Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes. It always seems to start here in the middle, kind of. I can feel a bit there now, but I've, got, I've had it more down each side as well. And I didn't know. At one point, I wondered whether it was my kidneys or something, or whether it's still the same thing. I don't know. Okay. And you said it's both sides. Do you mean together, or does it sort of flip from one side to the other? Yeah, n not together. It goes from one side to the other. So it really moves around this pain, doesn't it? Um, do you get bloated when you get the pain? Yes, very bloated. And can you tell me how long this has been happening? Well, I first had it several years ago. I had it when I was working, and a, a doctor I went to see said then it was probably irritable bowel. That was four years ago. Right. Was the bloating a part of that too? Yes. And did things settle down for a period of time? Yeah, they settled down when I was watching my diet much more and when obviously I wasn't as stressed. I'd given up work. OK. What about your bowels? Can they be a bit variable? Yes, very much so. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Um, well, I've always had a bit of a problem with constipation, mainly. But I mean, I'm going just just recently going perhaps a couple of days and not really going. And then like in the last couple of days, every time I eat, I seem to want to go. Right. And, and are you getting loose motions? It's loose, yes. Right. OK. Yeah, I mean, really, nothing has changed. I mean, I, I drink loads of water, but when I'm constipated, it's really hard and just like, you know, uh, like small brown pieces when I go. And then when it's loose, it's a bit ribbony. I've always had a bit of a ribbony movement. Yes. Is it true diarrhea or, or not? Mm, no. No. OK. Um, have you passed anything unusual looking? Any blood or slime or anything strange? No, I haven't. Haven't passed black motions as far as you know? No. Um, when you had the IBS before, what sort of things did you do for it? Um, I think, I think Dr. Dorsey gave me some Colifac, is it, or something like that? Yes, that sounds right. Was that helpful? Uh, kind of, because she explained to me about a kind of a spasm thing. Um, but I, I just kind of watched what I ate again. I mean, you know, it's probably worse if I don't go to the toilet. And so, you know, I try to eat things and, you know, to make sure I do go without taking anything, you know, without any laxatives of any description. And then I know it's probably really old fashioned, but I take peppermint oil, you know, the capsules. And I think they're actually really helpful. You hear a doctor and a trainee discussing the application of a plaster cast. So let's discuss the short arm cast that you're going to apply. What are the steps? Well, first, I need to examine the area and check the x-rays to see if surgery is needed. For the cast, first I'll apply a stockinette with a hole for the thumb, and then I'll wrap the arm in a web drill for padding. After that, I need to immerse the roll of plaster in water. Right. And what should you point out about the plaster? I need to warn the patient that it may feel hot as it starts to set. How long does it take to dry? The cast may feel dry to the touch in a few minutes, but it isn't fully dry for 72 hours. What's the last step? Mm, after I've applied the cast, I need to take another x-ray to confirm that the fracture has been reduced. You hear a manager explaining new data management processes to clinical staff.
Yes, in the back. You had a question? Yes. Uh, how should we file our feedback reports? Do we need to just complete them on the computer? That's a great question. Remember that since the clinic has begun transitioning to the new computers and software systems, we need you to fill out the paper reports in addition to the digital versions. I know this may be time consuming, but this is because as we transfer all our files from the old servers to the new ones, some files may be misplaced, and we want to ensure that all of our records are easily accessible at all times. So we need to make two copies of our reports? Yes, exactly. Great. Does anyone else have a question? You hear a presentation about the introduction of a new type of wound dressing. Thank you all for coming. Well, after some research, the hospital has decided to invest in a new type of dressing to care for our patients with chronic wounds, such as those with diabetic ulcers. Although the traditional cloth compression bandages are useful, they need to be changed frequently to promote healing. These new bandages are made of a natural, plant-based material instead. In fact, they're made from seaweed. Alginate dressings are somewhat costly but they can prevent harmful strains of bacteria from entering the wound by forming a protective barrier with the skin. Most impressive of all, they can absorb up to 20 times their own weight, so they're the best choice for wounds with high-level exudate. Based on these factors, we believe that alginate dressing would be a useful addition to our wound care procedures. You hear two hospital managers discussing completion rates for an online course. It looks like only around 40% of the staff have completed the online health and safety course so far. Less than half, but the course has to be completed by all staff members by the end of the month. Can we send them a reminder email? We've reminded them by email twice already. I've even phoned a few people. I think we need to bring it up at the general staff meeting next week. That's on Thursday afternoon, right? Will that work with everyone's schedules? It should. All staff members have that time already blocked out. But if anyone can't come, then we can speak to them in person, one-on-one. -on -one. You hear two colleagues discussing an online training course. Hi Fiona, how are you? Can I ask you something? Sure, Mark. What's up? Have you done that online training for a new record management process? Yeah, I did it on the weekend. It was supposed to take 10 minutes, but it took me ages. Did you have any trouble with it? I mean, any technical problems? Not really. I couldn't log in for a bit, but that was just me getting my password wrong. After that, it worked fine. Why? I keep getting this email that says I haven't finished all the activities and then when I log in, it says I've completed everything. It's driving me crazy. Did you ring the IT help guys? Yeah, they reset it, but it didn't do anything. I really don't want to do it again. Mm, no, you shouldn't have to. Maybe just send the register an email and let her know that you've done it. Maybe she can fix the issue. You hear an educator describing methods for creating medical abbreviations to nursing trainees. A technical name for the use of first letters is initialing, but I prefer to use the phrase the first letter rule for this method. 
Abbreviations using the first letter rule commonly identify diseases and diagnostic tests. For example, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is COPD, or liver function tests are LFTs. In most cases, these letters are pronounced separately as letters, but sometimes key letters or key syllables form the abbreviation. For example, hypertension is abbreviated using HTN, or we see the term atrial fibrillation abbreviated as either AF or AFib. Sometimes the first letters form an easily pronounceable word, an acronym. For example, acquired immune deficiency syndrome becomes AIDS, or severe acute respiratory syndrome becomes SARS. Understanding these principles will help you to more quickly learn the many abbreviations used in local clinical settings. You hear an interview with a health administrator called Dr. Marvin Lee discussing an article about delivering high-quality non-visit care. Patients are increasingly seeking to have their health care needs met without coming into an office, and there's a strong possibility that non-visit care will become the rule rather than the exception. I'm Jan Dean, and my guest today is Dr. Marvin Lee, co-author of a recent perspective article about strategies for delivering high-quality non-visit care. So, Dr. Lee, what do you think that the transition to non-visit care systems will look like? Well, I actually think you'll see a variety of responses. Existing medical institutions will pilot and are piloting these programs and gradually scaling them up. And at the same time, of course, new organisations are entering the market and changing practices, changing how things are done. So I think it'll be a mix of both of these. And really, my sense of this is that it first has to start with culture, developing a culture for non-face-to-face -face medical care. Oh, I see. Could you say just a bit more about what you mean by culture here? So what I mean is, if you create a culture in an existing medical organisation where an in-person visit is viewed as what you do after you have tried in a very safe and highly effective way to meet a patient's need remotely, I think this will change the game for how generally your organisation will think about the practice of medicine. I do think that we'll see some existing organisations differentiate and make that leap over, yet some new organisations will perhaps be at the advantage of being able to start from scratch. So I think we'll see a blend of these two responses. I see. So, you say in the article that the goal of a non-visit-based healthcare system would be to bring as much of the care and social support as possible into the patient's home. Does the technology exist to do that today? I think in many instances, yes, and the technology is really getting better. I think it's important to reflect on how things like smartphones, particularly in the last decade or so, have influenced our expectations. There's been a massive shift in how people in everyday life think about this and about how they expect to engage with services. So we really have to find a way to map onto that consumer demand. And I think for a lot of the basic medical needs that people have, the tech is there already. So what kinds of things do you mean? Well, if you look at clinical protocols for primary care, these are designed to help physicians and clients make decisions about appropriate health care for specific circumstances. I think you can quite likely do a lot of that very safely digitally before you even consider meeting face to face. But what about the times when a patient really has to be there in person? Well, of course, there are still those moments. But I think it's more about when that necessity arises. Is it earlier in the process of care or later? And what impact does it have on the patient involved? I think there are smart ways when you do need in-person visits and interactions to structure those so they have the least burden on the patient as possible. Could you give an example of what you mean? Well, one example we mentioned in the article is a scenario when a person has to provide a blood specimen or urine. They currently do need to be in person, but instead of building up an incredibly expensive office and lab infrastructure around a city, you could build up a very small collection of sensors that would be cheap to operate. The patient could simply drop the specimen at the collection point nearest them for it to be forwarded to a lab, minimal fuss, and wait for the data you need. So you can accommodate these face-to-face -face moments efficiently. Finally, how can organizations go about trying to transition towards models that deliver high-quality non-visit medical care? 
In time, as the technology and science gets better, gets more precise, organisations should just look at these situations that require in-person attendance by the patient and evaluate them, and evaluate that requirement against the currently available technology to see if it's something that could be safely transitioned to an online remote system. I think it's important to really critically evaluate every moment that someone has come in. And I think that if you do that, you'll start to see clear opportunities to reconfigure your care pathways quite dramatically. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with a public health researcher called Dr. Pauline Davidson discussing research on a secret safe injection facility in the United States. Okay, my guest today is Pauline Davidson of the University of California. Dr. Davidson is here to discuss the findings of two studies that focused on the effect of a secret safe injection facility in the US. Dr. Davidson, thanks so much for agreeing to talk with me today. So, what was your big takeaway from your research? One of the things people have said about opening safe injection facilities in the United States is that the US situation is fundamentally different from that of other countries where it's being used successfully. It's an argument that just because it can work in Europe or Australia or Canada, doesn't mean that it'll work here. The big takeaway from this research and all the data we have so far is that these kinds of facilities have a similar effect here in the United States as they do elsewhere. They reduce harms associated with drug use, and they reduce social nuisance associated with drug use in the same way they do elsewhere. Basically, anywhere that you have a concentrated street-based drug scene involving a lot of fairly impoverished people using drugs, you get the same set of problems, and the people using drugs have the same set of problems. And these facilities deal with them quite well, whether they're in Vancouver or in Los Angeles in Skid Row or any other area with a lot of drug use anywhere. So how did staff get the secret facility going? This is an organization that was providing other services to drug users. They were in this really frustrating situation where they had a lot of people they provided services to who were dying of overdoses, after looking at safe injection rooms and how those work elsewhere in the world, they realized that if they waited for advocacy to legalize these facilities in the United States, all their people would be dead. So after a good deal of discussion about it, they decided to implement something along these lines. Initially, they started by re-equipping their bathroom, so it was better suited to safe drug consumption. But that had too many logistical problems. They couldn't use the toilets because drug users were in there. They had a spare room available, so they refitted that. They modeled it after the Vancouver facility and opened their doors to a group of their longer-term users and continued ever since. What actually happens? How do they ensure safety and that kind of thing? Well, it looks pretty much like an ordinary clinic. It's a fairly large room with five separate stainless steel injecting stations, and the staff are always in the same room as the clients. People come in, do a check-in on a laptop, sit at an injecting station, and prepare and then use their drugs. Then there's a couch if they want to sit there and wait for the immediate effects of the drug to wear off. The staff are trained to use naloxone and, if necessary, call 911. And since they're in the same room, they observe people injecting, and if they see some injecting practices that are less than ideal from a public health point of view, there's an opportunity to talk about that. So there's a number of benefits to having the staff member in the same room, rather than just overdose prevention. What are users like about the facility? Well, the biggest one that they kept talking about is how they're able to get out of the public eye take their time, and use in a clean, well-lit space. People talked about using in the public eye and shooting up in a hurry between two cabs in the streets. They were very much aware of passers-by, not just because it's illegal, I mean, they're aware of the police, but because they're aware that it's not seen as a nice thing. They're particularly terrified of being seen by someone's children. So being able to get out of the public eye was very much a relief. So there's a serious benefit to their well-being, how they feel about themselves. 
Did users have any complaints about the facility? Mostly that it wasn't open 24-7. They really liked the space, and they would like it to be open far more often. A couple of them also talked about the problem of how the organization couldn't closely coordinate or do referrals to other agencies because they were trying to keep this all in the down low. Users were quite aware of this. They were saying it would be better if this organization was really closely coupled with a treatment agency and that handoff could be much better. The staff were also quite bothered by the fact that they had to keep the facility to a fairly small number of people and felt like they had to exclude people with mental health issues because they felt like including them would be more likely to lead to disclosure to third parties. So the organization couldn't serve a number of people who were likely at a higher need.